Hello everybody, my name is Paul Buitink and today I'm going to have a conversation with Professor of Banking and Finance Richard Werner, who wrote the number one bestseller in Japan, Princess of the Yen. He has also developed a theory of money creation called the Quantity Theory of Credit. He is also the first economist who empirically proved commercial banks do indeed create money out of thin air when they issue a loan. We're going to talk about the way central banks and governments are managing the economic crisis, particularly the ECB. We're also definitely are going to talk about central bank and digital currencies. Hi, Richard. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me, and I'm glad it's finally worked out. Yeah, yeah. It took us a few years to to, to come to a date, but uh, <laughs> this weekend uh, we made it work. So very, very glad with that. Um, f- first, a bit uh, more about your background. Um, what are you currently up to? Uh, there's a few things. Obviously, uh, as a university professor, um, there's there's a lot of tasks there. Online teaching, for instance, and uh, writing papers to be published in academic journals, which is a very slow process. Um, but then also various projects. I'm leading the project to establish not-for-profit local community banks in the UK, starting with the Hampshire Community Bank. Uh, we've just had our challenge session with the UK regulators, the Prudential Regulatory Authority and the Financial Conduct Authority and passed it. So we're moving a step closer to getting our authorization, which is very exciting. Um, and of course, there's others. I've just launched a new uh, journal, academic journal called the Journal of Banking, Finance and Sustainable Development. You can see that um, on the uh, web page, the publisher is called College Press. So collegepress.org.uk. Um, the journals on there that's just gone out um, this week actually um, and what else I mean there's so many projects running <laughs> amazing <laughs> we'll, many things at the same time as we go on <laughs> yeah yeah and this especially this this local uh, um, bank initiative I'm look forward to hearing all the details about that uh, because that's actually one of the one of the main uh, topic I topics I wanted to address with you uh, I see on Twitter you've been very critical uh, on central bank policies, especially uh, ECB policies that uh, over time um, have led to the disappearance of many smaller banks. Um, yes. So could you elaborate um, a bit more on what, what exactly is it that you don't like about ECB policy? Well, <laughs> that's quite a few things, but let's start with the, the anti-small bank or anti-bank policies. Essentially, since the ECB, uh, was created and started business 20 years ago. Since then, um, 4,800 banks have disappeared in the Eurozone alone. And that is under the ECB's policy. Uh, Now, I'm a firm uh, uh, believer and fan of, uh, well, one thing Paul Samuelson did, and it's probably the only thing (laughs) I like, and it's called his theory of revealed preference. In a nutshell, uh, don't believe what what people say they're doing and why they're doing things they're doing. Uh, They may not even know properly in in words or in in terms of, uh, you know, intellectual concept themselves. Watch what they're doing. Their actions reveal what they're doing. And of course, that's You know, you could also have a a Christian interpretation. You know, Jesus said, uh, by the fruits of the tree, you will see, is it a good tree or a bad tree? The result matters. So actions, deeds, and the results. And of course, anyone in the markets is always looking at, um, you know, what is the actual action? You know, you can say so many things. There's so much hot air in the financial markets being produced by people. Uh, What are the actions? And use that principle to analyze central banks. Um, And really, we we should start by looking at their fundamental claim. Central banks always tell us, what's their goal? What are they trying to do? Well, we're here to achieve stability, stability of prices, stability of the economy, stability of growth, stability of currency, stability this, stability that. It's all stability, stability. Some speeches, um, I did word counts, and time the number of times they mentioned the word stability quite amazing anyway now look at the fruits look at the result look at the actions what is the revealed preference the revealed preference is quite the opposite stability is exactly what we're not getting from central banks we're getting um we're getting cycles 
business cycles. And in fact, the time of mere business cycles has also passed. We're in the era of boom bust cycles being created by central banks. The, and, and at the same time, you see, you have to be aware, these central banks, they, they've become extremely powerful in the last 50 years. They became the most powerful actors. And of course, everyone in the financial markets is aware of that. Um, but it's, it's interesting from a political economy perspective, they formally become so powerful as never before in history, in human history. Um, and um, they can do what they want. Now, they may sometimes say, oh, we're doing this because the government is telling us to do. Well, if they choose to, but they don't have to. And often they will say, no, we're not doing this. So again, reveal preference. You know, what they're doing is what they want because this is particularly true for central banks. They have so many options. They have so many tools. They can invent new tools. Um, now, so we've got these very powerful players and the ECB is the most independent, most um, unaccountable central bank um, in the world. Not necessarily in history, because as I wrote in my book, Princes of the Yen, um, and that was in 2003, um, I did an analysis of the structure of the ECB and how it's designed and its powers. And I concluded that it was not modeled on the Bundesbank. That was the official story. Look, that's it's the in myth, Frankfurt. Yeah, that's it's, you know, the German, the German Central Bank is very successful. That's ECB is just a successor. It's just a bigger sort of Bundesbank. Um, well, I came to the opposite conclusion. What made the Bundesbank successful, they took away. And what the Bundesbank's um, predecessor, highly unsuccessful predecessor, the Reichsbank, what made the Reichsbank the most disastrous central bank in the world, that's what they reintroduced in the ECB. So the ECB is not um, just the continuation of the Bundesbank. It's actually the revived Reichsbank, which is the title of the chapter in, in Princes of the Yen. And that's published in 2003. And I predicted that for these and these reasons, you know, read the details. I expect the uh, ECB to follow in the footsteps of the Reichsbank, totally unaccountable and power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. And central bankers maximize their power if they create cycles. And it will create a bank credit driven um, asset bubble, asset bubbles in the Eurozone, um, which lead to banking crises and large scale unemployment, massive recessions. And of course, I mean, it was published 2003, but for the, from 2004, the ECB started to implement this um, 20, 30% credit growth in Ireland, Portugal, Spain, and Greece, huge credit booms, busts, and then of course, large scale unemployment, 50% youth unemployment. So, um, and what is the, the, what is the main objective then? So you, you say they create cycles uh, and, and what is, what is, what they want to achieve with those cycles then? Um, I started out, discovering this and, and you know initially i didn't know anything about this and i had the usual you know fairly naive view that you have when you study economics at, at university at lse oxford all the mainstream stuff but i was then in japan for years and i realized we're just looking at reality well this is quite different what's happening here is very different from these theories um and in a nutshell what i discovered and documented in every detail from different angles in the book Princes of the Yen is that the Japanese central bank um, created this huge asset bubble and very long recession intentionally in order to achieve its actually goals that it had previously um, made known and I pulled all that together so um, there's not with hindsight just saying, okay, you know, it's just a new interpretation of the data with hindsight. No, actually you could go back and you could see that they had actually uh, key people had said this, and then you follow the data and follow their actions and the key policy tools, which is all about what is the key policy tool of central banks. It's not interest rates. Interest rates is the price of money. And I did also an empirical analysis of that. Um, they always say that lower rates lead to higher growth, higher rates lead to lower growth. And the, um, you know, the economy follows these interest rate policies. Empirically, there's absolutely no evidence for this whatsoever. The reality is that interest rates follow growth and they're positively correlated. So interest rates are not the key monetary policy tool of the central bank. That's not even possible. What is it? It's the quantity of credit creation. 
Yeah, and that's and, this, but that's and, and with that policy, you could you could see what they were doing. And so the Bank of Japan was creating this massive asset bubble, and then it was tightening and creating this massive recession. Why? The goal was, as they had declared actually before all this happened, and that's you know I use that as a subtitle of the book, the structural transformation of the economy which was essentially a U.S. plan, and the Bank of Japan was their agent in Japan um, to implement this, because the, the Bank of Japan plan was almost uh, verbatim, the same as what the Americans have been demanding in the negotiation with Japan's Structural Impairment Initiative. Japan has to change. We need to, you know, what was the story there? Well, <laughs> it's obvious Japan was too successful. Japan was highly successful, and the Americans didn't like it. That wasn't really the plan. Um, so they had to change. Officially, the Americans were advising the Japanese uh, in the 70s and 80s on how to improve their economy. Well, <laughs> Japan was doing so well. Um, and did they really need American advice on how to improve the economy? Or oh, you, you are quite inefficient. And this is all this, you know, you need to deregulate, liberalize and privatize. And then you get even more efficient. Oh, really? Is that really what America wanted? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't think so. Of course, the goal was to destroy the Japanese post-war high growth system. And so not to have to deal with this threat anymore. Of course, the other threat this created was that other countries would adopt the model. And other countries did adopt the model early on. It was Taiwan and Korea that adopted this. And they, you know, just exactly the same thing happened, of course. Um, but then more in the, in the um, 70s and 80s, increasingly developing countries were saying, hey, do we really have to adopt this IMF World Bank policy advice? Um, it's really not leading us anywhere good. And we've seen this, this Japan and then Korea, Taiwan, they're doing something different. Shouldn't we perhaps do that? Oh, no, no, you, that, no, that doesn't work. It's very inefficient. Um, and of course, that's the other reason why they needed to destroy the Japanese model. And so um, so basically you're saying like central banks have a certain goal in mind uh, yes. and, and in order to, um, to achieve that goal, sometimes a crisis is needed. Yes, of course, a crisis. I mean, how can America persuade, and of course it was acting through the Bank of Japan, but, but also partly and it was open in these political uh, negotiations, trade negotiations, uh, which concluded Japan needed to change its economic structure, the, you know, everything really. Um, and, and how can America justify this logic? Like we were doing this to help Japan to make Japan even more successful. You know, it's just totally implausible. Uh, the truth was, is to destroy the high growth successful system. And there's no better way to do this than to introduce the IMF World Bank advice that had been given to developing countries for the last half century, over the last 70 years, namely to deregulate, liberalize and privatize and wipe out any domestic um, industries by totally opening up very early on. And essentially you get bought up and taken over by foreign interests. So that's what Japan was supposed to do. And of course, um, that's and going and then going back to ECB. What? Uh, how could you draw the parallel to, then to what's happening over the past twenty years with with the ECB and the policies they have um, implemented? Exactly. Actually, um, in in Princes of the Yen, I already show that this Asian crisis um, was also run by the central banks, the Bank of Thailand, Korea, Indonesia, um, which did the same thing. And the goal was again structural transformation to open up these economies for Western interests and um, essentially get rid of the high growth um, successful system and give it a bad reputation. And this is what many people think today. Well, this East Asian high growth didn't really work, did it? Um, and um, so that was, that was the goal there. And what about Europe? Well, essentially the ECB followed the Bank of Japan plot in, in great detail. And partly there's this very similar goals and partly, of course, transferred to Europe. There's, there were some different um, concrete goals of the structural transformation that they had in mind. Um, the similarity is the neoliberal agenda of deregulation, liberalization, privatization, which allows essentially the central bank to be the key agent. And part of these reforms is always to make the central bank independent, which the central bank is, of course, like. The Bank of Japan, when it created the bubble, 
and then bursted and started the recession, it was still not independent. So it had to work by stealth. It worked because of the, um, this false economics, which made most people blind to what's really happening. And central banks have been doing a lot to support this false economics and their research departments. I mean, they're the biggest employer of economists in the world and they produce very misleading economics in their research departments. Some, of course, some people there are very, you know, uh, well-meaning and they're, you know, young, you know, uh, graduates and they get hired and they think they're doing the right thing, but it's very easy then to get manipulated into this um, neoclassical fiction economics using the deductive methodology with hypothetical axiomatic approach. You can come up with anything really on that basis. And so this central bank research uh, was used to, uh, to propagate this. Um, and um, in Europe, um, this, this neoliberal agenda was also the goal of the central banks. And of course, you know, ECB has been pushing that deregulation story and so on and so on. But at the same time, you say too much regulation is currently a problem and killing uh, small banks and actually benefiting the big banks. So it's well, but that's the irony. See, this is the contradiction. Uh, you're not supposed to notice these contradictions. So central banks say we need deregulation, liberalization, privatization. But what about the central banks as regulators? They're you introducing after 2008 massive new regulations, killing banks. So it's, well, it's the same institution saying on the one hand, no, labor market all needs to be deregulated. Unions, no, it's very, very bad. We need to get rid of them. Um, and we, we don't need to have regulation. But at the same time, the central banks, because they're bank regulators, they're introducing massive amounts of regulation. And I'm a professor of banking and I've been trying to keep up. It's just extraordinary. The amounts of, and these documents that they create as new bank regulation is another 600 pages of EU bank regulation. It's another, you know, 550 pages. And each small bank is supposed to not only know this and understand it, but constantly implement this. And there's constant, every year there's new stack of new rules and regulations. It's just unbelievable. Of course, the small banks have to give up. Um, yeah, so that's one, one of the is, reasons that of, over th yeah. 5,000 banks have disappeared because of the stifling and ever-increasing yes. Basel 1 but, to infinity. Uh, yeah, um, they just can't afford it. They need to hire too many people just to keep up with these regulations and compliance and the reporting, unbelievable reporting. Well, the, the small banks were never the problem. They didn't create the banking crisis. Oh, you know? I remember Plus, we anyway, all said banks, we, we, needed, we needed smaller banks. Everyone after 28 said too big to fill, that's the problem. We need smaller banks and 12 years later, we only have bigger banks. Exactly, because the reality is the central bankers as bureaucracies, they're big and they like to, you know, big players want to play with the big boys. They actually do like to just speak with Goldman Sachs people and BlackRock and, and so on. Um, the biggest institutions, that's sort of their level. Small banks, you know, they're too arrogant is that to, to actually, you know, that's too small, tiny. We don't want to deal with them. Because the other uh, factor that, that's been killing uh, banks, small banks in particular, are the interest rate policies. Now, I already mentioned interest rates are not really the key monetary policy tool for the economy, but they are a tool to influence the banking system. And they have been used systematically as a tool to hurt banks. Yeah, the profitability of banks, of course, is very much depending on, Precisely. on the interest rate level. Um, yes, and also the yield curve, you see, if you flatten the yield curve and push it down to zero or have even an inverted yield curve, that means no future for banks and you're killing them. Then, then the smaller ones are forced to, to merge with bigger ones, they get taken over. And then we get more and more, I mean, the banks become bigger and bigger and fewer and fewer banks. We get this really bad banking system. But let's just compare, actually, you compare um, the UK, which shows us the future of banking systems. There's five big banks and more or less nothing else. In Holland, we um, have three. Okay, so yeah. And a few smaller ones. The Netherlands but, yeah. is also very similar. Um, but compared it to Germany, where there's still um, over... 1,700 banks, and the majority of them are not-for-profit local community banks. But of course, you know, we're witnessing the last days for these because, um, I mean, they've been under so much pressure. It's amazing they're still, they're still there. Um, but so 70% of deposits in Germany are with these not-for-profit local community banks. UK-style high street banks, which in the UK are... Um, 
over well close to 90 percent of of bank deposits in germany are only 13 percent of bank deposits and 70 percent are with these 1,500 not-for-profit community banks. But of course, their number has been falling every year because of these problems. Now, what, what does this create? Well, there's, there's two great benefits of the, I mean, there's more benefits, but the key two benefits are when you have a problem like a crisis or a shock to the system, which one is actually uh, more able to, to withstand the shock? The bigger boys. The concentrated system with the big banks or the yeah. ones with diversified many local, many, many local banks? Actually, for shocks, the diversified, yeah, yeah, decentralized one yeah. is the one that is resilient. That's the right yeah. word, exactly. Thank you. The resilient system is the one that's decentralized. And when the 2008 shock happened in Germany, there wasn't even a proper recession. Unemployment essentially didn't rise. It didn't rise because it was mostly Germany's banking system. Mostly small banks. They were not involved in this crisis. And they continue to lend to SMEs, and that's the second point. Why what is about the Landesbankers in Germany? All these uh, uh, yeah, local big banks. banks. They, they all, they're, no, they're, they're not local too? banks. I'm not talking about Landesbanks. They're big banks. Okay, because they invested and, in all these. Uh, um, yeah, uh, and they mortgages. went bust as as the as other big banks okay. like uh, Dresdner Bank has disappeared, and various Landesbankers. But these are the big banks. I'm talking about the 1,500 very small local banks like Volksbank, Raiffeisenbank, um, and Sparkassen. Bank, you know these local. They. It's but how like do they deal with all the regulation? And apparently they are able to. Uh, so doesn't that contradict then your earlier point that it's difficult or impossible for small banks to survive the ECB regime? No, no. Because speak to any of these. It is very hard for them to survive. And as I said, it's amazing that they have survived, but they've been struggling. And I've been in touch with them. I've, in fact, spent uh, almost three years at one, uh, doing a, you know, as a professor, doing an internship with a bank on the board level. Uh, going to all their board meetings and and formally I was uh, the also participating in their credit decisions. I was um, deputy head of the um, corporate loan department, uh, which is great. I mean, it's just you, it's so interesting, and I learned so much. But and also went to all their association meetings where they meet with all the uh, corp, you know the the cooperative banks, um, regular meetings, and. They they've all been saying, you know, this is the last few years. We we can't survive this much longer. Yeah. Okay. They so, they, they so, have been surviving yeah. to the extent that they have because they're so well organized and the system is such a strong system that it's taken so far twelve years for the ECB um, to to crush them, and they haven't quite crushed them. But it's now last stage, and so and perhaps maybe I can, another I can five also... years, and they'll be. They'll be gone. I can also uh, but, imagine but that local to, people are willing to pay a little bit more, perhaps to make use of those banks uh, and um, in order to support those banks. Is that also true? Yes, yeah, well, yeah, that's important for people to realize that it's important to support these banks. Um, ultimately, though, if the central bank is against them and the central bank has been against them, then it, it just the future does look dire. But just to complete one more point, so. Um, the other factor that makes a system that's decentralized and has many small local banks attractive um, is, of course, that's you know, um, is is for for the users of the banking system because banks should just be a utility that provides good service. Um, that it it does that job, whereas the big banks don't. Now, there's a fundamental rule in banking: big banks want to do big deals with big players. They lend. To big companies. Big banks don't really want to deal with small firms. But who's the main employer? And it's true for, for Germany, for the UK, for the US, for Japan. It is SMEs. SMEs are um, usually uh, the, the employer of between 66% of total employment in the UK, where they've been suffering for a long time, and that's why it's a lower number, to something like 75% in Germany. Or even eighty percent in Japan, uh, and the Netherlands the same thing. They call the engine of the economy always. Uh, as yes, and they are. They are now. Um, and and look at, at Germany. I mean, German economy has been quite successful for the last two hundred years, and the SME sector really has been an, a key engine of that. Just look at the exports. And of course, exports is a, is a good expression of competitiveness, and. A big percentage of German exports are due to small family-owned firms with n names that you've never heard of. 
but yeah. they're global market leader in their narrow niche and they export across the whole world. How is that possible? This is not true for the UK, absolutely not. What's the difference? Well, the difference is here we have a concentrated banking system consisting of these five big banks, 90% of deposits there, and they don't lend to SMEs. And that's, that's well studied and researched. And every two, three years, we get another banking commission report on the problems of the UK banking system. I like this one, the Colwyn Commission report proclaimed that after study and interviews and, and research conclusion, the problem is that the big five dominate banking in the UK. Uh, they only lend to the, the big firms. They don't lend to SMEs and they don't uh, give long-term loans, only short-term loans. So there's a big uh, credit supply problem for small firms. Colwyn Commission, and this was publicized in 1918. Rinse and repeat, over, yeah. Over a century, exactly, yeah. over a century ago. But nothing was ever done about this. Well, the alternative is, of course, a German system where you have many small local banks. And who do they lend to? Small local firms. But the They're risk the only of, banks with, that will ever lend to With the risk firms. of sounding stupid, but the ECB did um, provide for more than 1.3 trillion in loans to banks, uh, also with an incentive for them to lend out to SME, right? They could even get an interest yes. kickback. They, they get money for free if they would lend out to SME. Yes. Yeah. You see, so and is, that the same, then? is that a good policy tool? Well, the same has happened in the UK. The government has tried, because the problem is recognized, so they've tried to bribe banks and they have this funding for lending scheme, which is what the ECB was looking at when it introduced its own scheme. Actually, it's first done here in the UK. Um, and essentially, it doesn't work. You can even bribe the big banks. They will still not lend to SMEs. It's just not worth their while. I mean, it's quite obvious, you know. If you're a big bank, a uh, balance sheet of um, you know, 2,000 billion pounds, and you want to grow because you're shareholder owned um, by 5%. I mean, you need to increase your balance sheet by billions, double digit billions, 50 billion. So um, what, what, do you, what do you do for that? I mean, if you actually want to lend to SMEs, um, that's one thing. You could do that. And you need millions and millions of 20,000 pound sized loans. And each time you have to do this analysis, credit analysis, check their usage of the funds, is, you know, what are they doing and so on. But it turns out that that cost and that time is exactly the same whether you give out a £20,000 loan or a £200 million loan. Yeah. We see a lot of fintechs, of course, trying to automate the whole process. And, and some of these fintechs are actually owned by the bigger banks. So they're trying to find a way to, uh, to make it possible to lend to an SME in a very cost efficient and easy way, where you don't think that's, that's going to make any difference. No, but, but first, sorry, just to complete the, your earlier question. So the irony is that, um, you know, that um, the ECB has been saying, we want to encourage the banks to lend to SMEs. And, and we're bribing them, you know, by, by these programs. But it's not working because even the bribe is not big enough in the system and policy framework the ECB has created, which is um, a flat yield curve or inverse yield curve, negative interest rates. This lending is not um, profitable on the one hand, but on the other hand, also you're killing banks. You're killing banks and they get bigger and bigger. And the fewer banks you have and the bigger the banks are, the less they're going to lend to SMEs. And that's what the ECB has been doing now for over a decade. And yeah. therefore, but, but just the goal to, saying, oh, the goal to right destroy... now, increase lending, it's just not going to work. Yeah. The real problem is the systemic problem of the ECB's policy, sorry. But is, is, there, is there a goal then to, because it's, it, you started the conversation with saying that ECB has an anti-bank policy and, and then we talked about the small banks, okay, and slowly but surely the small banks are, are, are disappearing, they're either bold or they merge or they stop. So we have a few big banks left in the UK, it's five dominating the, the, the landscape here in Holland. We have three big banks having 80% of the deposits, I believe. So, but what is then the next step? Is, is, is it the ECB's goals to eventually do away with banks at all? Or do you think they want to keep a few big banks um, uh, in the end? Well, yeah, maybe it's time to talk about the, the end game. <laughs> what is the end game? <laughs> I know well, you have 40 minutes, so we're halfway, so it's... Still, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. more than halfway, I think, but, yeah. Well, um, to understand the end game, and of course, this is also what, um, what, what's happening in the, uh, in the Eurozone uh, with the ECB, is um, 
Um, the central banks are looking to compete against their regulated. Now, just um, reflect on what's happening. The central bankers are regulators of banks, and the ECB has even become more and more powerful in being a regulator. By the way, I should add one thing. I've, I've been warning for, for, for years, one reason why central banks haven't, why central banks and this habit of creating crises, crisis after crisis, because we're rewarding them. After each crisis, we make them more powerful. So we have the problem of regulatory moral hazard, which is that the regulators have an incentive to have a regulatory problem, a crisis, because each time we say, oh, oh, we have a crisis, what's the solution? Let's give more power to the regulators. Yeah, and well, this was actually the reason oh, let's I give got more interested. power to the regulators. Yeah, you're so right. of course, this was the reason I got interested in, in, in these things uh, in the first place, because after the crisis, which I, I thought was primarily also because of uh, low interest rates and, and central bank policies, I was highly um, surprised, naive as I was, that central banks were rewarded with even more power. Uh, to create yet the next crisis. So uh, I totally see your point there. Exactly. And so this is happening. So the ECB has been given re more regulatory powers. And I'd, I'd been warning of that before the crisis. And then they, they, um, they, were not, they were so shameless to ask for more powers. The ECB said, and they gave very misleading representations, even to the European Parliament, that, oh, this crisis, we have an island, Portugal, Spain, and Greece. Well, it's because we didn't have enough powers as regulators. It's not true. In Ireland, the central bank was the regulator, and that is part and parcel of the ECB system, has always been. In Spain, who was the bank regulator? The central bank. So it was absolutely not true. And of course, the single biggest impact on bank performance is the central bank's activities. And so that there's no way the ECB can deny its responsibility, but that's what it, what it did. Oh, it's, it wasn't us. It was these bad banks doing these things. You know, I'm a critic of banks, of the big banks and the wrong type of banking, but I've always emphasized that like the 2008 crisis, we should not blame the banks, not even the bankers. Of course, you get these excesses and criminal activities, but yeah, don't, don't blame the players, blame the game, right? It is the regulators. What did we or tell the, the banks to do? You guys go out and maximize profits. And that's all they did. So how yeah. can we blame them? It's the regulators that set the incentive structure and the environment. So, so here we are. So the ECB is now even more powerful as bank regulator. And what are the bank regulators now doing? They're now coming out and they're saying, and in fact, in the background, think about it. If you just have this, again, revealed preference idea, and, and this is you know the regular is this the central banks being bureaucracies they want to constantly increase their power how else can they increase their power they're already so powerful are they going to stop well apparently not they've come up with another way to yet increase their power by another factor a whole factor into a new dimension namely and this central is the end bank of digital currencies the regulator is saying well actually we think well, of course, they're not saying this like this in public. So I'm giving you the straight talk first. And you'll recognize how they, they put this out to the public. Um, so the central banks are saying, we're regulators of the banks. We now think we should, re we should compete with the regulated. The banks that we regulate, we as regulators should now step into the market and compete against. We want to outcompete the banks. And of course, talking about unfair competition, talking about conflict of interest, how on earth can, can this be right when the regulator who's got power over all the other players and can kill them, as it turns out, considers himself as a competitor. They want to step in and compete against the banks. And it's a historical moment in, in history and, and certainly financial and economic history because so far the activities have been quite delineated. The central banks are focused on one thing and the banks on another. What we're now seeing is the ripping up of this, what Charles Goodhart calls the concordat, this implicit agreement between the central banks and the banks, each has their own area. The central banks are now stepping straight into the turf of the banks. Why? What is this competition about? Well, they put it in terms of central bank digital currency in order to um, obfuscate what's happening. Because that sounds like, okay, it's just like um, paper money is what they issue. And so now it's going to be digital paper money. And so it's similar. No, it's very different. And actually, what is a central bank digital currency? 
It is a current account at the central bank. That's all it is. That's really all it is. Yeah. Okay, you can do this through some kind of uh, distributed ledger technology or whatever. I mean, that's just the technology. That's, but in terms of economic reality, and the accounting also shows this, it is, of course, just a current account at the central bank, but it's a retail current account. It's banking. So in other words, the central banks are saying, we're not going to be a bank and anyone can bank with us. How on earth are the banks, the, you know, the, the normal private sector commercial banks, how are they going to survive if the central bank, with all the backing of the state and all the regulatory powers the central bank has over its competitors, is going to step in uh, and do this? But, Sam, but, but commercial banks have also always survived uh, the cash uh, um, uh, problem as well. I mean, central banks have always issued cash, which is also competing with banks, and they've been perfectly able to, to compete with that as well. So don't you think... Yes, that but if, that was the delineation. The, you know, the, the central banks have paper money cash, but the digital currency is run yeah, by okay. the banks. Yeah, yeah. You see, that's the I other see, obfuscation. The yeah. we already, a, lot, I mean, a lot of people actually ask for this, right, Richard? A lot of, uh, there's popular support in many different countries for these types of initiatives. And of course, it really depends on, on, uh, on how they're going to build it and under what, which uh, conditions. But for example, in Holland, I know the people very well behind Onschelt that are actually pushing for some sort of central bank digital currency. Um, and I, I believe they have the right intentions. How, how, would, you, um, how would you align that then? You think well, it's, it's driven by central banks? Them, and I wouldn't be surprised people. if the bureaucrats aren't, the central planners aren't funding them directly or indirectly. Um, but it's, it's mis-selling. It's, it's classical mis-selling. It reminds me very much of what happened in the 1990s. In the 1990s, we were told um, by various players, including the central planners, that, oh, we need to, we need to, well, I should say the other way around. What they actually were doing was they were abolishing the European currency in the 1990s. They were preparing the abolition of the European currency and they were selling it cleverly as the introduction of the European currency. Yeah. Now we have the European big. currency and it's, it's the European currency that was market determined based on competitiveness and performance and the markets determined that is the European currency. Of course, I'm talking about the Deutsche Mark and other countries started to join and peg themselves to the Deutsche Mark and it became a block, but it was all voluntary and based on market performance and central bank performance. And the Bundesbank was a good central bank when it still was one. I mean, it's not, uh, it's a shadow of its former self now, of course. Um, and then they told us, oh, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna um, introduce a European currency. Well, actually, they were abolishing the de facto European currency we had, the DMARC, and introducing this Euro was a complete mis-selling. And the same thing is happen happening with central bank digital currency. Why? Because we have digital currency. We are using digital currency every day. It's bank transactions. Banks have digital currency. They create 97% of the money supply, which is digital currency. 3% is central bank product paper yeah. in most countries. And 97% is digital currency produced by banks. And that's what we have. But monetary the reformers, banks. they argue like that we are new now too uh, much depending on commercial banks. And when we introduce central bank digital currency, at least you reduce some of the dependency. Um, and that is a good thing. At least that's what, that's what they argue. Um, don't you agree with that then, that you at least make the commercial banks less powerful in the system? But they are not powerful in the system. It's the central banks. And doesn't it strike you? Uh, as strange that these critics and these monetary reformers that criticize the system in order to improve it, that they never hit upon the reality. The whole thing is run by the central planners at the central banks and the power of the central banks. And you give them more, how come more they power never criticize this, yeah. the central banks? Yeah. Well, fact, some of them, of course, want to have a, a new institution. Money. There's also, for example, in Holland, they want to uh, create a new institution. So they would give power to a new institution. But of course, powerful people will run that institution probably. But you could also... Uh, make sure that uh, through uh, procedures and representation that the new institution is actually run by the people instead of by the um, the central planners who currently have the power. There's all sorts of different setups you could you could consider if you implement such a, such right. a scheme. Right. Well, the the key dimension to keep in mind here is centralization versus decentralization. Always keep that in mind. Now, mm -hmm. um, and of course, to to analyze things scientifically, we have to look at uh, empirical 
data. The empirical data is not on the future because we don't have that yet. It's on the past. So what is the empirical data telling us about this question of monetary system centralization versus decentralization? Now we have the system that many central bankers today seem to favor. We already had that in the past. It's the system, the monetary system of the Soviet Union. There was one bank, one central bank. And that one central bank was the only bank and that created all the money and centrally issued it. Uh, it was also digital currency, a lot of it, some paper, but mostly digital as well. Um, and um, this system was a disaster. It did not work very well. Now um, compare this to another very large country by population much larger that also had the same system as the Soviet system and that's China. Now China uh, initially had a Soviet style economy, but then in 1978, um, a new leader came to power in China, Deng Xiaoping, and he analyzed the situation and he concluded that the Soviet system is doomed to failure. And that's of course dangerous, he concluded for, you know, um, for the country, and it's better to abandon this system. And instead, he looked at other countries that had a more successful monetary system, such as Japan and Germany and the US. And he concluded, well, we need to decentralize banking. And so when he came to power in 1978, what, what was the key? One of the key things he introduced was he founded thousands of banks, thousands of new banks, local banks, small banks, uh, regional banks, specialized banks all across China and the rest is history. That's how you get high economic growth. America, when it had high economic growth, it had um, close to 20,000 banks. Yeah. And, and this is how you get economic growth. And as we said earlier, that's also resilient. You but want agree with the you, money 100%. creation. Yeah, well, you want more decentralization. But, at this, but then if I follow your logic, do you believe then that by introducing central bank digital currency, for example, in the Eurozone, the end result will be a one bank Soviet style financial system where, where the ECB has, 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 has gained all the power and all the other banks have disappeared, even the big banks? Is that the end result? Of course. There's no other, there's no question about it. In fact, there's actually a study now just come out uh, by the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia saying just that, that once we introduce central bank digital currency, the banks will disappear um, and um, they will either disappear through the political process. That's what the monetary reformers like positive money want. They want to abolish banking uh, because once you take the power to create credit from banks, they're not banks anymore. So, you know, they're non-banks. Yeah, because they uh, want so banks to be intermediaries. They want abolition. They're not banks anymore once you can't create money. That's what makes banks different. That's what makes banks yeah. banks. So they want to abolish banks. So either the political process, abolishing them, or as we had in Switzerland, this um, referendum, the population decided to keep money creation decentralized and keep the decision-making decentralized and not centralized control in the hands of the central planners. Um, or the market will, once you introduce the regulator as a player, that will create through market forces uh, the same situation where all the other players will die out. But we know then, uh, if you look back at history, it will lead to another crisis in, in the future. Because if we have one uh, bank left, the central bank, the, uh, eventually they will also come crashing down, as we've seen from the past. So the, the central planners probably know that this that uh, experiment will end up eventually in disaster. So well, that's not be, how they think. Their, that's not how they think. You have to think that there's a theory called the theory of bureaucracy. Uh, which is quite useful is from politics, political economy, and, and that needs to be applied to central banks. Of course, a bureaucracy wants to become ever more powerful. So from the viewpoint of the central planners, the story is um, we need more power. Um, who's creating money? Oh, it's the banks. We don't like that. We want to be the monopoly. We want to create all the money. So let's start competing against the banks. And of course, you know, you see, the central bank digital currency plan is quite old. I mean, they've been discussing this for over 10 years. And therefore, we should, now that it's very clear what their plan is, they've come out into the open, we should review their past policies for the last 10 years um, in this light. Because then we'll see that maybe 
they weren't actually doing a good job as regulators. Maybe they were already biased by the fact that they wanted to kill banks because they're going to join the fray and become competitors. And, and of course, that's what, what actually happened. But it reveals that they were not doing a good job as regulators. Therefore, why should we give them more power? It's the same regulatory uh, moral hazard. Bad regulation is being rewarded by giving them more powers. So there's no, there's no question about this. That So from a central bank's viewpoint, um, they want to um, compete against banks and they know that the banks will disappear. And of course, they can help this disappearance in many ways. And they've, they've done this and they've shown the, their hand. Yeah. So they know this. they will get power, but in the end, they also must realize that power eventually they cannot handle. But that's not how central planners think. Central bankers do recognize there's risks, but each time they will say, well, we can mitigate this risk. How? By increasing our control. So you see, once you have central bank digital currency, we will abolish, of course, cash. Banks will be either disappeared or will be formally abolished. Uh, so all the competition will be abolished. And then how can we control things further? Well, we will have negative interest rates, of course, and we can help ourselves from people's pockets. Then we can actually essentially usurp the treasury departments, finance departments. There will be a takeover by the central bank of the government because, uh, and, and here's the other strand that we haven't mentioned yet, which is all linked to this. At the same time, what's being propagated in the last 10 years is this idea of universal basic income. Now that's a very old idea. Um, it goes back over a century, social reformers, socialist um, campaigners had said this a hundred years ago, we need this, uh, whatever, people's dividend or something like a people's salary, uh, universal basic income, you know, okay. Why is this idea, which used to be radical communist socialist 100 years ago, suddenly now propagated by the billionaire class? Literally, you've got the billionaire families coming out and Zuckerberg and all these people. UBI is a good idea. We're supporting this idea. And of course, now with this COVID um, crisis and in inverted commas, um, all these trends are being accelerated, whether central bank digital currency or this basic income, which is essentially being paid out in the U.S. already, or you know, in, in various ways being introduced now. Um, the idea is this essentially makes people totally dependent, and the control of the system is increased. And the universal basic income is essentially then this: um, you know, you get some credits in your central bank digital currency account with the central bank. Um, and it's all centrally dished out the reward, but also the punishment. No more so privacy. Worried about crises? Well, we now have total control. If there's some troublemakers, we'll switch them off. Yeah. Um, we see what people are doing. We see where, where, they, where they are, what they're buying and selling. Oh, here's a critic of central banks. Well, sorry, uh, there's a technical problem with your digital currency. So it's a bit like what we already see in China the, with the social credit system. Uh, it's worse. It's worse. Actually, the Chinese, uh, to be fair to them, they, um, so on the front of digital currency, they thought about this apparently, because what I realized when I studied this is that they've designed their central bank digital currency in order to ensure that the great innovation that Deng Xiaoping introduced 40 years ago in China will continue. In other words, they're not going to harm the banks. And their um, digital currency system is designed to work with the banks, not against the banks. So it's worthwhile for us to study that because that should be the model, really. Yeah. Uh, the social credit uh, uh, rating, of course, you know, that's maybe something that's we don't dystopian. want to. Yeah. But uh, uh, OK, so I, it's very interesting uh, the points you make. And you, of course, you're an academic, but you also uh, practice what you pre preach because you're setting up local banks in the UK. But, uh, it strikes me that um, that will be a very difficult uh, uphill battle um, because you're still ha you still have to participate in the banking system in the UK. You still have the Bank of England. You still have all the stifling regulation. Don't you believe uh, there is uh, um, a better solution could be or would be to come up with your own local currency, whether it's a cryptocurrency or just some local currency, in order to really set up something parallel to the existing power structure? Yes, yes. Well, I think that's, that's, that's an issue. Um, I mean, if you pursued that and if you think it through, you will find there is there's some obstacles to that. 
and 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 for example like um some people you mentioned earlier who've been trying to introduce alternative currencies it, the problem is always to get people to actually use it and therefore you have to work in steps and in phases and the first step is to create that local community and a local common um financial infrastructure and that is exactly what local community banks are doing that has to come first then you can talk about you know what to do next with with local currencies yeah interesting well i know i've already used up a lot of your time but it's such a fascinating conversation i could go on for hours uh, and do you think COVID could lead to more localism because uh, people travel less people uh, tend to possibly uh, look for more local solutions and supply chains do you believe that could be a positive side effect of of the uh, COVID crisis well the the policy decisions of course are towards acceleration of the whole um control and central planning agenda but i think in people's minds a lot of people have started to think well hang on we, we have to watch out the central planners are not necessarily thinking of our good of our you know of, the, of ordinary people and therefore who is going to help me it is your local area it is your neighbors it is your family and i think a lot of people have realized that but that that wasn't the plan but i think that's you know that that is a development so there is hope and i think yes with the right local activities we can turn this into something that accelerates local community development that's a hopeful uh, a message to end the conversation with i think richard uh, or is there anything else you want to you want to add well, I think that's fine. We'll, we'll just have to have another conversation next time. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, because there's so many things to discuss. But um, I, I definitely would advise people to at least watch a documentary, The Prin Princess of Yen, because um, it's it's an it's an it's a classic. Or right? it's been watched many times uh, online, millions of times. And your book, of course, was a bestseller in Japan. So if you don't have the time to read the book, at least um, watch the documentary. I'll, I'll put it in the show notes. And yeah, it would be nice to have this conversation again, uh, Richard, in the yes. future. Uh, um, because yeah. There is one thing I'd, I'd like to mention, having um, thought about it quickly when you said, is there anything else? Well, um, actually, there is one thing, and that is um, in our movement to establish community banks, we need supporters and we need help. Of course, it would be nice if we could receive help from very uh, powerful players, namely the big banks. And I've been trying to reach out to big banks to um to try to understand that um by helping us they're helping themselves and here's my logic i'm actually quite shocked that the commercial banks the big banks don't realize what's happening they're doing nothing in order to uh, fight for their survival they're about to be annihilated they see smaller banks disappearing and they think oh that's fine we're big but actually, you know, that's, you know, soon they're becoming for the, for, for you as well, you know, for the big, for the big boys. And when the, for them to survive, when uh, the, 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 the laws are being put before parliament to abolish banking entirely, there, there will be some debates, hopefully still. Um, but for the big banks, it'll be very hard to argue, oh no, we are doing a good service to society. Therefore we need to survive. Nobody's going to believe them. But if they can say, um, okay, we've been bad in the past, but if you abolish us, you'll also abolish these community banks. You see, they have a chance then of surviving and people saying, no, actually, we don't want that. So maybe we shouldn't abolish banking. And that's why they should support small local community banks. They're not really threatening the big banks, but therefore a cooperation with the big banks would be in their interest. And so Perhaps if, you know, some big bankers watching this, you know, do, I'd like to reach out and do get in touch. Cool. Well, that would be a very uh, interesting alliance then. So maybe, maybe we would see big bankers with pitchforks at some point. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm sure um, a lot of bankers uh, will watch this uh, interview as well. And, and if they can um, help out uh, community banks, uh, such as your initiative, that would be great, of course. So thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Richard. Uh, and have a good weekend. And um, yeah, let's see. Maybe we can do it again in the future. That'd be great. Okay, thanks. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye.